their lives by a great deliverance. So now it was not you that sent me hither, but God. And he hath made me a father to Pharaoh and lord of all his house and a ruler throughout all the land of Egypt. Going now to chapter 50 and verse 15. Chapter 50 of Genesis, verse 15 through verse 20. And when Joseph's brethren saw that their father was dead, they said, Joseph will peradventure hate us and will certainly requite or repay us all the evil which we did unto him. And they sent a messenger unto Joseph, saying, Thy father did command before he died, saying... So shall you say unto Joseph, Forgive, I pray thee now, the trespass of thy brethren and, the, and their sin, for they did unto thee evil, and now we, rep, we pray thee, Forgive the trespass of the servants of God, thy, of thy father. And Joseph wept when they spake unto him. Verse 18, And his brethren also went and fell down before his face, that was his dream come true, and they said, Behold, we be thy servants. You better, because <laughs> he definitely your master. And Joseph said unto them, Fear not, for am I in the place of God? But as for you, you thought evil against me, but God meant it unto good, to bring to pass as it is this day to save much people alive. It was God's plan. It was God, God knew the famine was coming and he needed Joseph to go through a nightmare to bring deliverance to people that were going to need food. And Joseph went through it. And God made something beautiful out of a mess. The great thing about Joseph and the, the message to us would be this. It's how you treat people who have done you wrong when you're able to get them back. The world calls it karma. We ought not pray for karma. That's not what God wants us to pray for. God wants us to pray, God help them, keep them, save them, deliver them. You know who that helps when you pray like that? You. You put it in God's hands and then you're going to sleep better. Well, you don't know what they did to me. Well, I know what they did to Jesus. They put him on a cross. And he prayed, Father... Forgive them. They didn't, they didn't deserve to be forgiven. He still asked the Lord to forgive them, though. For they know not what they do. They didn't realize he was the Lord of glory. They were crucified. But nevertheless, he gave us that example of when you are done wrong and you don't deserve it, still pray for good things. Not easy to do, but if God asks us to do it, I believe God will help us if we'll ask him to help us. Amen. Amen. Corey Ten Boom, she's a famous lady. She's got a powerful testimony and some really good books. I think my wife read some of her books. Have you read some of her books? I'm not sure there's any book my wife hadn't read, to be honest with you. She reads, what is it, three books a day? I don't know how many books. She, she, reads, the, she reads books I don't even dare get started in. They're so big, I'm thinking it's like reading the encyclopedia. Why? Just, just. I'm going to look up a word. That's all I'm going to read. She just reads the whole thing. It's like, man alive. She reads some big books. She reads a lot of books. That's why she's smarter than me, but I'm not going to compete with her because I'm not going to start reading all them books. She can get the trophy. But Corey Ten Boom was sick with the flu on the day a man came to their small house, watch shop, where her dad fixed watches. And he insisted on speaking with her, and Corey and her family were sheltering Jews at this time from the Nazis in their home. And Hitler was in charge, and they were in trouble if they got found out. Corey later recalled there is an old Dutch expression, you can tell a man by the way he meets your eyes. In other words, if a person is lying, they probably won't look you in the eyes. They'll look everywhere but in your eyes because their conscience is getting on them. 
This man seemed to concentrate somewhere between my nose, she said, and my chin. The nervous Dutchman who came that day told Corey that he and his wife had been sheltering Jews as well in their little home, but his wife had been arrested and he needed money to bribe the police, the Gestapo, to get her release. Torn and uncertain as Corey was, but yet unwilling to, to chance turning him away empty-handed, she told him to come back in half an hour and she would have the money to help him. But instead of the Dutchman returning, the Gestapo arrived a little bit later to raid their house and arrest the whole family. Later in the work camp, in the prison camp, a vault, Corey found out that the man who had come to their house that day was named John, John, John Vogel. That's how I say his name. He had been collaborating with the Germans. In her, in her book, The Hiding Place, Corey wrote how she was feeling at the moment this happened. She says, flames of fire seemed to leap around that name in my heart, his name. I thought of my father's final hours alone and confused in a hospital corridor of the underground work so abruptly halted because of what this man had done. The Jews who would probably now die and maybe my whole family that would die. I thought of Mary arrested while walking down the street and I knew that if Jean Vogel stood in front of me right now, I could easily kill him, she said. Hatred was in my heart for what he had done. This man had betrayed Corey, her father, her brother, her sister, and everyone they, that had been, they had been helping was now betrayed. And it must have felt impossible to believe anything good could come from such an evil situation in her life. Her dad died. Many of her family died because this man turned them in to the Germans. Up in Canaan, the famine began pinching the food supply of Jacob's family. Crops failed as the famine raged. Emergency stores ran low, and before long, they were facing the very real prospect of starvation these Hebrews were. And Jacob learned there was grain in Egypt, so he sent his ten eldest sons to go buy some food that they might survive. Joseph and his brothers are on a collision course now in the Bible. What will happen when they meet now that the power dynamics have been completely reversed? Joseph was royalty in Egypt, second in command in the world power over the whole world. His brothers were commoners from a strange land needing food. Now Joseph's in charge. Thirteen years had elapsed. Joseph was no longer a 17-year-old lad. He was a man in his 30s. Once his brothers had stripped him of his coat of many colors, but now he was dressed in the finest linen of Egypt and decked with gold everywhere. Once he had cried out to his brothers from the bottom of a pit, but now he was standing over them in royal power. The transformation was so complete, so complete, the Bible says that his brothers did not even recognize him. He was in the power. But rest assured, he recognized them. It seems Joseph was undecided at first about what to do with his brothers. He did not reveal his identity to them. Instead, he decided to test them to see if they had changed inwardly over the past 13 years. First, he accused them of being spies and held them in prison for three days. Joseph then sent his brothers all on their way, all except for Simeon, whom he bound and put back in a prison as a hostage until they brought back their youngest brother Benjamin who they had told was back home Joseph's younger brother 
He wanted to see him. They returned home with the grain for their family. But Jacob, their daddy, refused to even consider sending Benjamin to Egypt. He'd already lost Joseph. He didn't want to lose Benjamin. Eventually, the grain they had, though, ran out. And Jacob reluctantly sent them back to Egypt, and he had to send Benjamin. For Joseph said, if I see your face again and Benjamin's not with you, I'll kill you. So they either had to bring Benjamin or starve to death. That was their options. This time, Joseph received them rather differently. Instead of putting them in prison, he freed Simeon, took all of them back to his house, and ordered his servants to prepare them a feast. And he gave Benjamin the most in front of the eldest to test them, to see if perhaps their heart had changed. The next day, Joseph sent them on their way, but he told his steward to hide his silver cup in the mouth of Benjamin's grain sack. And no, no sooner had they started on their journey than he sent his guards out to accuse them of stealing his cup. Whoever had stolen it would be put, be, become Joseph's slave, and when it was found in Benjamin's sack, the other brother's reaction was telling where once they had willingly sold Joseph to be a slave, now the very prospect of losing Benjamin to such a fate was a horrifying prospect for them. Judah actually offered himself as a slave in the place of Benjamin, pleading for mercy for the sake of their father. They had truly had a change of heart. It is an even... It is interesting, an interesting what-if scenario to wonder what Joseph would have done if it had turned out his brothers had not had a change of heart. That could have happened. We see they did have a change of heart, thank God. We don't know what he would have done. But they had a change of heart in those intervening years. But the fact is, all of them changed in that 13-year period, but not just them, Joseph had changed too. Just as Joseph put his brothers through tests, so he had been through many tests himself, himself and been tried. Even at this moment with his brothers completely within his power, Joseph was being tested by God. True character is shown by how we treat those beneath us. That's where real character is shown. It's those that you could do wrong. It's how you do them that God looks at. You can't do anything to those over you. If you do, good luck to you. Because they may not have a Christ-like spirit with you, but those who are beneath you are the ones you have to be very careful how you do. There's a saying, power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely because without Jesus Christ, we cannot handle power. No one can. Every one of us would do wrong with power, especially those who've done us wrong. Well, now the tables have turned. I knew this day would come. I'm going to get you now. You got to be careful. You'll be praying for God to get them. Not get them to heaven, but Lord, send them to hell. Let them burn, Jesus. Oh, that happened in the Bible? Jesus' own disciples, the sons of thunder, said, Lord, let us call down fire on them. And Jesus turned and said, you know not what spirit you're of. But they've done us wrong. He said, yeah, but I didn't come to destroy them. I'm here to save. Imagine for a moment that you are Reuben or Judah or one of the other brothers. Joseph sees they have had a change of heart, but they do not know the years have changed him. They don't even know who he is. They probably were expecting the sword to fall on them, and they probably felt like they deserved it, and they even said so. This is happening because of what we did to Joseph. Karma's coming back to get us. They don't even know it's Joseph, but they feel like they deserve it. 
you might be like me. At times, I feel like, you know, I really don't deserve heaven. I've done too much wrong. Thank God for his mercy. Because there won't be nobody going to heaven that deserves it. So why not go? Because everybody there is going to be throwing their crowns at his feet and saying, I don't deserve this, but you're merciful. What's so great about God's mercy is that we don't deserve it. Why would he do that? Why would he look beyond my faults? He could start over. He could find somebody else. But he's a good God. Amen? They probably were expecting the sword to fall and dumbfounded, thinking they deserved it anyway. They could not even reply to the questions of that ruler standing before them. They were troubled at his presence, the Bible says. And Joseph said to his brethren, come near me, I pray you. And they came near. And he said, I am Joseph, your brother whom you sold into Egypt. Now, therefore, be not grieved nor angry with yourselves that you sold me hither, for God did send me before you to preserve life. Wow. You've heard me say it before, but how would we handle our situations if we thought this horrible situation is God preparing me for something? I wouldn't choose it, but God's going to do something good out of it. Now, I do believe for God to do something good out of it, we have to keep a right spirit or at least try to keep a right spirit. We're not perfect. Don't get me wrong. You're not going to go through stuff and just be smiling about it every day it happens. There are going to be situations in your life that you're going to have to, you're going to, have to forgive one day at a time, every day for a long time. And you'll forgive that morning by that evening. It's eating your lunch again. You've got to say, no, I've given that to the Lord. I'm not carrying this around. Notice how carefully and kindly Joseph approached this reunion with his brothers. They didn't know it was Joseph till this time. First, Joseph prayed them to come near him. He was not demanding and he did not push them away. Our approach to people has a lot to do with how they respond to us. If you're going to straighten somebody out, don't start with harsh words. A soft word solves a lot of problems. You might want to start with, you know what, I first want to let you know I love you. And I want the best for you. And I don't want our relationship to ever be broken. There's some things I want to discuss with you, but I don't want you to think I hate you in any way because I don't. you got to start the right way. You can't come in saying, bless God, I know I'm right and you did me wrong and you, be careful. Pastor, I don't know why they got so mad. I was right. Yeah, you were right, but you handled it wrong. He didn't demand. He had the power to demand, but he didn't. He said, I pray you come close. He didn't push them away. Many hard conflicts could be resolved peacefully if we Follow this example. Addressing an issue face to face and with kindness is so much more effective for resolution than lashing out from an impersonal distance. That's what social media has allowed us to do. We get to lash out from a hidden place. You know what that does? It just causes more strife. Well, I'm not going to put their name on it. I'm just going to mention the stuff they did. I won't put their name on it, though. You're not helping things. Let me get you. Let me tell you where I live. I don't know how many times I've done this now, or I've kind of gotten away from a lot of them, thankfully. Type it all out. And the Holy Ghost says, don't hit send. I heard a story years ago about Mark Twain. Mark Twain might have been a dead man a whole lot earlier if his wife hadn't helped him out. He would write hateful letters to those who were against him. He'd drop them in the mailbox, and his wife would swing by and take them out. He 
<laughs> you know, if you live by the sword, you die by the sword. But if you live by peace, you can have peace. So Joseph pulls them together, not with lashing anger or domineering spirit, but with kindness. Next, Joseph reassured his brothers of their relationship. He said, I am Joseph, your brother. His next words, however, were quite piercing because he did not candy coat the situation. He said, whom you sold into Egypt. Joseph had not forgotten. He brought it right out into the open immediately to be dealt with. Nothing can be healed until it has been brought out into the open. Rather than getting hung up on the harm his brothers had done, Joseph willingly forgave what they had done and focused on the good God had brought out of this horrible situation. To the, one man said it like this, to err is human, to forgive is divine. But do remember this, forgiveness is often not a one-time event. You're going to forgive them today, and guess what you're going to have to do tomorrow? You'll forgive them again. Man, I wish I could just do it once and be done. You're not. Some wounds don't heal quickly. But no wounds heal if you keep digging in them. Forgiveness is the bomb that heals you. Forgiveness may not heal them, but it'll certainly heal you. Without God, Joseph would have likely executed a fearful revenge on his brothers for what they had done to him. Slavery, torture, and even death were all within his grasp at that moment in time. And some would argue that within his right. But instead, Joseph chose to forgive. It was not his enemies that had done this. It was his brothers. His own household had put him through this horrible, horrible situation. One, I think it was the Psalms of David said, if it had been my enemy, I could have bore it, but it came from the house of my friends. Five years of famine were still to come and trekking back and forth between Canaan and Egypt for food was not a, very long-term good plan. Instead, Joseph sent for his brothers, sent his brothers home with food and wagons and provisions for the journey to bring his father and all their families back to the land of Egypt to ride out the famine. God's plans are greater than our plans. His ways are higher than our ways. And his thoughts are past, the Bible says, are finding out. I got a feeling there's some things God couldn't explain to us because we don't have the ability to understand it. But rest assured, God does have plans. Not all God's plans come to pass. Because there's a verse in that Bible, the Lord said, I know the plans I have for you. Saith the Lord, thoughts of good and not of evil to give you an expected end. God says, know what I want to do. And I think one of the primary things he wants to do is he wants to save everybody. Was everybody going to be saved? No. But God wants to. We should witness. We should reach. We should love. We should teach. We should do. But don't ever think that God's limited to us. We're working with him, but he's working a whole lot more than we are. I got to be with you to teach you a Bible study, but God can wake up in the middle of the night and talk to you. God has a plan. Every trial, every trouble, every terrible situation. Things I can't even explain or understand why. Some things I look at, I say, man, if I was God, I'd stop that. But I'm not God, and I can't stop it. People say, Pastor, pray, what do I do? And I say, I don't have a clue what you should do except pray. I don't know what to tell you. And I go to God, and I'm like you, Lord, why? What are you doing? I wonder how often Joseph prayed that. I don't know. God allows things to happen because he has an expected end in mind. 
And the Bible says we know that all things work together for the good to them that love God and are the called according to his purpose. But that doesn't mean all things are good. It's not so you can have glory or comfort or revenge or any of those such things, but God is doing it all that he might save people. This whole thing in God's eyes is about eternity. I, I've posted on our sign before, man's greatest uh, need is salvation. Man's greatest problem is that he is neglecting his greatest need. We're ignoring what we cannot avoid. We're all going to live somewhere forever. You know what God's focused on? Eternity. And he'll use the temporal to try to gain more in the eternal. We don't understand that, but God does. Because it truly doesn't matter what happens in this life. All that matters is where am I going to be a thousand years from now? So when I pray, I say, Lord, do whatever you got to do to save me. And while you're at it, God, do whatever you got to do to save my family. If you got to put me in a cardboard box, do it. I won't like it. I'll pray for you to change it. I will not be very good with it, God. But you see things I don't see. And if I'm that hard-headed, for goodness sake, do good to me and put me in a cardboard box. Not an easy thing to pray, but it's a wise thing to pray. God knows what it takes. And he's looking at all things through an eternal lens. Joseph's whole problem was for the salvation of people. That somebody would be able to save the world. And that's what Jesus did. Joseph's brothers returned to their father, Jacob, with the wagons and all the stuff, with incredible news. They came back and their daddy thought Joseph, I mean, yeah, they thought he thought Joseph was dead. Here they come back. How do you explain to them when Joseph's alive in Egypt? Because I think they had a heart change. They had some confessing to do to daddy. What do you mean Joseph's alive? How did he get to Egypt? Well, dad, sit down for a minute. No, I'm going to stand. No, dad, please sit down. You, if you, you, you're going to pass out if you stand when I tell you this story. It's our fault, dad. We did it. There's a little bit of truth in that one, too. The father didn't throw them away either. When we, do each, when we do each other wrong, God still forgives us. You know, we have trouble forgiving each other. The father had no problem forgiving the prodigal. You know how trouble, who had trouble forgiving the prodigal? The brother. The brother. Let us be careful that when God forgives, we don't stand there and say, yeah, but I remember. Uh-huh. I know what you did. Don't help the devil out. Because there ain't going to be nobody in heaven because we were so righteous and holy that we deserved it. Joseph's brothers return to their father Jacob with incredible news. Joseph is alive. Not only was Joseph alive, but he was second in command in Egypt. At first, Jacob could not believe it. When he saw the wagons and all the stuff sent, he was convinced. And they packed all their baggage up and they moved to Egypt, to the land of Goshen. And the land of Goshen is a message too because the land of Goshen was a place they were set apart from Egypt. In my opinion, Goshen is symbolic of the church. We're in the world, but we're not to be of the world. What the world thinks is right doesn't really matter to us. Our right is set by God. He decides what's right and what's wrong for us. Amen? While still in Egypt, the day came for Jacob to die. And he did die, and he blessed Joseph and Joseph's two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim, there in Egypt. And then Jacob, whose name was changed to Israel, gathered the rest of his sons around his bed and prophesied over them all and blessed them. And when Jacob died, Joseph 
had him embalmed in Egypt. And then all Jacob's sons traveled back to Canaan to bury their father in the cave of Machpelah right alongside Abraham and Sarah and Isaac and Rebekah and Jacob and Leah. Took him back to bury him. After their father's death, Joseph's brothers feared Joseph. You know why? One thing that kept him from killing us is gone. He wouldn't kill us for daddy's sake. But now daddy's not here. Joseph's brother feared Joseph would finally take revenge on them. The brothers sent a messenger to, to Joseph saying that Jacob wanted him to forgive them. They said, now remember, Daddy, he wants you to let us off the hook. Well, Daddy's gone. I'm fixing to see the real colors of Joseph now. Then they came themselves and fell down before his feet and said, Behold, we be thy servants. It wasn't like they had an option. Might as well volunteer. But vengeance was so far from Joseph's mind that he broke down in tears. He said, fear not, for am I in the place of God? But as for you, you thought evil against me, but God meant it unto good to bring to pass as it is this day to save much people alive. Therefore now, fear not, I will nourish you and your little ones. You did me wrong, but I'm fixing to do you right. That's what Jesus does every time he forgives us. We do him wrong, he turns around and does us right. What the devil intends to use to destroy us, God reshapes for something good. God will use even your problems, your strifes, your past sins God can use. Because now, because you've been there and you've been delivered and you've come out, God can use you to tell somebody that's there right now, you know God will lift you up out of that. God will break that chain for you. God will help you. Well, how do you know? Because I've been where you're at. God can take things that are bad and turn them into things that are useful. We all have brokenness, and we're all broken. We're just messed up. I think that's why God made women to an extent, because men just don't come wired. That was Eve's job, to get the wires connected correctly. I talked about that years ago here, but can you imagine Adam? He's running around the garden putting holes in things and cutting things down. And God says, I got to get somebody here to stop this dude. So he gives him Eve. He sees Eve and he says, whoa, man. Time for me to straighten up. Amen. <laughs> hey, man. We all have brokenness. But brokenness gives God an opportunity. He picks up the shattered pieces and make something beautiful. God is not repelled from us because of our brokenness. That's actually what attracts him. It's our weakness that attracts his strength. He loves us because we're helpless. We're foolish. <laughs> we need help bad. And that attracts him to us. After learning that after whatever her name was, I talked about the beginning. Corey Ten Boom, after Corey Ten Boom learned that a fellow Dutchman, John, John Vogel, had betrayed them to the Germans. She was so consumed with anger and hatred that she stopped doing her Bible studies that her and her sister had been doing together in the prisons. She sat on her workbench and she was so eat up with anger and wanting revenge so much that she grew physically ill. 
She tossed and turned at night. She could not sleep because of the anger that was boiling over in her soul. Meanwhile, her sister Betsy, in the same prison, seemed perfectly fine. Finally, Corey had had it up to here. She burst out to her sister one night. She said, Betsy, don't you feel anything about Jean Vogel? Doesn't it bother you at all? And her sister replied, oh, yes, Corey. It bothers me terribly. And Betsy went on to say that she prayed for him every time his name came to her mind. This is what she said. She said, how dreadfully he must be suffering. What? You're the one in prison. She said, oh. How horribly he must be suffering. You know, people that do you wrong are eat up with guilt. They're hurting. They may not turn and ask forgiveness, or, but their conscience is eating them up. And the devil's saying they'll never forgive you for what you've done. I hope and pray that prodigals don't come home because they think we'll never forgive them they don't deserve it but neither do we we don't deserve it either he's been good to us why can't he be good to them yeah but they've done worse than me really there's a whole lot of stuff in each one of our lives that God's covered and he keeps it covered for our sake thanks be to God Somebody say, praise the Lord. Can you imagine, though, his, her sister said, every time I think of him, I feel awful for him. Well, you're the one in prison. How terribly he must be suffering. Convicted, Corey pressed her face into her straw-stuffed mattress that night and prayed for forgiveness for the murder that was in her heart. She prayed blessings on Mr. Vogel and his family. And that night, she said, for the first time since she had learned his name, she said, I finally slept peacefully. Wow. Forgiveness just sets you free. Let's stand. It's not easy to.